Okay, it's uh, great to be here today. We're, uh, my colleague Stoss and I are very happy to be out of D.C. We spent the last 12 days, including both weekends, putting out the public market report so we've, uh, on the market break. So we've been in a bit of a fog, and it's nice to have a change. I have to say that my views here are my own and do not necessarily reflect the views of the SEC. So I very much enjoyed uh, reading this paper, and I, thought, I think there are a lot of nice attributes here. Very brief summary, I think Bob has already done a great job. The dual trigger depends on the institution stock price falling, as well as that of a broad financial institutional index. Some of the nice features of this uh, proposal are that it does permit institutional fa failure. It does not depend on accounting values. Um, and it requires a widespread drop in uh, a financial institutional index as well. No regulatory involvement. So uh, Neil Pearson has a paper call it, called The Dark Side of Financial Innovation. So I think you might look at Bob's paper and some of the other papers in this space as the bright side of financial innovation. Um, he already mentioned Mark Flannery's paper and the Squam Lake proposal as being similar to his. Uh, Robert Schiller has a paper which looks at uh, securities that the U.S. government could issue. Uh, where the coupon is tied to U.S. GDP. So I think we're going to see more proposals like this where financial innovation is used as a response to the crisis. I'll talk about manipulation just a little bit. I think Bob does a great job of talking about potential manipulations in the paper, and he did a nice job today, too. So while the index would be difficult to manipulate itself, once the index is already down, then you have more of an incentive to manipulate the stock itself. So it's going to depend, obviously, on whether the cost of manipulation is less than the potential benefit. The cost of manipulation will depend on how much you have to manipulate, the liquidity of the stock. Um, he discussed today that perhaps you could use an average price over a certain period. Wondered if he could maybe speak in the paper about the use of a gradual trigger, so you have um, a sort of a flow converting into ownership rather than you know, one hard trigger. Uh, reversible ownership maybe would be another response to manipulation, but I think that would be a, a very much of a legal challenge um, to enact. And Larry and Hans Dutt have a paper talking about manipulation in the derivatives market when you have cash settlement. Uh, Pete Kyle also addresses that. Of course, regulators have to think about the trade-off between, between potential manipulation of this contract uh, versus the fact that maybe there will be no bailouts uh, once, we have, once we institute a contract like this. Also being a regulator um, for the past three years has made me really appreciate how difficult it is to enact the details. So I think it would be great if the paper talks a little bit more about how would the trigger price be chosen. At the SEC, we have a lot of rules that deal with thresholds, and we have to spend a lot of our time thinking about uh, what the right threshold should be. And without a model, uh, as Bob says, we don't have a model of the optimal capital structure here. A lot of our rules, just as an example, we don't have a model of how many foreign issuers should be able to deregister from the SEC. Yet we somehow have to allow them to do so, and we have to choose a threshold. And it's a very difficult thing to do. So I think it would be nice to talk about that. Um, what's the right trigger? Would it vary by firm? So just introduce some of these details. And what happens after the conversion? When do you have to introduce more contingent capital? Some more of the implementation issues, I think. These banks could be part of a holding company uh, with a lot of other activities. Also, not all financial institutions are publicly traded. So what do we need to do about those institutions in order to protect um, in times of crisis? Ed talked this morning about how do we choose the systemically important firms for which we want to require them to issue contingent capital. Um, that's definitely a quagmire of how we're going to uh, choose what the, the most important firms are. And I think the proposal still has a problem in that it does depend on accounting values. So if you want to choose the amount of contingent capital that needs to be issued, you have to understand what the current level of capital is at the firm. And we know that with Lehman, the view of the regulators of what Lehman's capital was was not what it actually was. So I think you still don't quite get away from having to rely on accounting values. Will investors have the appropriate disclosures that they need um, in order to understand the true level of the capital of the firm so that, that they can price this new contract. A little bit more um, in terms of implementation issues. Just, I think it would be nice to discuss how the monitoring will change. So it would be, once the conversion um, is enacted, then we would have a switch from 
concentrated debt holders to concentrated equity holders at a time when the firm is, is close to bankruptcy or is at least in financial crisis. And you may view those as interchangeable, interchangeable that a block hold, an equity block holder maybe um, has the right incentives for monitoring uh, as a concentrated debt holder would. But I think this is something that should be discussed in the paper. And Bob is not trying to address the unwinding process, but we would still need to have um, a mechanism for under, unwinding these complex firms, even with this contract. Thinking about the role of the regulator here, which regulator would have the authority to require the implementation of this type of contract? Uh, not the SEC, I'll talk about the SEC's role, so perhaps this would be the Fed. Uh, the overlap for the SEC is that we do, uh, the SEC in general does not have the ability to impose capital requirements on firms, to impo impose a form of capital structure, except in the area of broker-dealers, where we do impose capital limits. And so broker-dealer, um, as part of a holding company with a bank, we would have overlap there. Contingent capital securities would have to be registered with the SEC, so we would have oversight in reviewing the contract. And, uh, of course, we would monitor for manipulation um, in, in these types of contracts. Other possible measures, uh, we've already talked this morning about whether the IRS would, uh, how they would grant tax treatment for these types of securities. Some other stronger or more aggressive things that have put up, been put out there is that these kinds of contracts, if we don't want to mandate them through regulators, perhaps the exchanges would require them through their listing standards. Um, some have even said, forget these types of contracts. Uh, fragile firms should not be allowed to be traded on an exchange if we're worried about bank runs. Bank runs. So uh, in general, I think the proposal has a, a lot of strengths to it, and um, I would like to see it discuss more of the details and the implementation issues. Uh, regulators would certainly appreciate that discussion. So thank you. I guess the only comment I'd make uh, about accounting, these are accounting measures, is um, where I really think they shouldn't be used as a trigger, is in, is in actually deciding whether or not it's it triggered. Um, in terms of designing the lower frequency question is how much ought to be issued and how much more comfortable. This uh, whole idea strikes me a little bit like pre packaging a bankruptcy where you've really already determined everything. So instead of going through a bankruptcy process, we've decided what the claim is going to look like, we've decided everything, and it's imposed externally. But it's it still it a lot like bankruptcy. But not <laughs> so that's exactly the question I have. So when comparing this to a bankruptcy, um, the question is, what's the advantage here versus the bankruptcy? Is it just the speed? In fact, it's almost instantaneous and the clarity of the outcome. Um, conversely, your argument is this gives us a little time. And I'm thinking, well, doesn't the automatic stay essentially give us a little time anyway to sort things out? So just a little more, if I'm viewing it, if I'm incorrectly viewing it as a lot like a, a bankruptcy. And if it is, then really, how is it going to Well, so, uh, yeah, so, so I guess, um, so, so Chapter 11 seems to work well for non-financial firms. Financial firms have the issue that they have very funded. So, and they have very fungible, you know, to the extent we finance the short term um, liabilities, the firm can basically be destroyed before it has a chance to go into Chapter 11. You know, if, 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 you know if, if the issue is run, right? So, so, so the, the question is whether you can do something that somehow reduces the incentive to run or minimizes the cost of a run. And, 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 I, and that's why I think, I don't think of this as a replacement for bankruptcy. Instead, I think the whole point of the, having the second trigger was to let firms go bankrupt if they're uniquely bad. So I'm not saying avoid bankruptcy. What I am saying is in the event that you have a systemic shock, it, it's, a, it's a possibility of having a whole extra capital at that time. Now, you know, it's not it's not going to say it's not going to. Can I The point here is that we are facing highly leveraged so a limited amount of conversion can actually impact a significant amount of capital. And uh, you can do this quickly, pre-packaged, and that can help deal with all sorts of uh, market dynamics that would otherwise play out. And it's certainly not going to replace the uh, bankruptcy. 
Where's the infusion? I don't see an infusion. It's just a restructure. Well, fine. But that's, that, that amounts to the same thing as five. Isn't that exactly what a bankruptcy does? It restructures the claim without But, but it does have a much lower transaction, transaction cost. Oh, that's so that's that's all I'm saying is this, is this just because it's vastly more efficient than what otherwise would have been? I had, a, I had another question, actually. It was a lot of, um, uh, a lot of emphasis on manipulation, and that's certainly important. Um, uh, I'm wondering whether the main issue is not like the investor community in two ways. First of all, I'm not sure that there is going to be a sizable investor community for that sort of instrument. Uh, you can address this by saying, well, it's not panacea. So it, it, it's still going to have a useful role in a big load of things that we are planning to do, so that's fine. But uh, then still you will be facing the question of perfectly straightforward, non-manipulative, funny behavior. Uh, the moment that you are uh, that you are uh, moving towards the trigger, because if I, as a debt investor or debt fish investor, are holding this sort of instrument, I'll unload it, uh, offload it. <laughs> uh, so I, I'll either sell the claim or I'll short equity to do that, and then you get pretty much the same effect that we're talking about in terms of manipulative behavior, but in a perfectly straightforward, rational, non-manipulative way. And I was kind of wondering how you would want to address that. Well, you know, uh, this is being discussed as if there's no covenant package that would be optimal in terms of, of, of making it better than, than a pre uh, I mean, than a non pre package. That uh, manipulation could be handled by covenant uh, to a great degree. I, I think trying to think you could write a simple contract would have to be quite complex to part of the problem. It's, it's simple, you see, maybe with the people. Uh, I think it, it, until you put covenants in, it doesn't make sense. But I still say, if we just let the dividends be tax deductible in banks in order to reduce this uh, uh, under undercapitalization, we would, we would get benefits back to the, the value of the safety net. I'm having trouble understanding why, frankly, why it's so complex. Clearly, if it's, uh, the trigger depends on market prices, then there are uh, market manipulation problems. If it depends on accounting, it's got a serious problem. If it depends on the regulator, it's got a serious problem. What it ought to depend on is what we really care about is, uh, first, uh, it should convert uh, automatically if there's a failure, if there's a default on, on payment of the interest. The interest payment should be sufficiently high on the bond so that it matters. Uh, so that in the event of the conversion, the company all of a sudden uh, gets the lead of a very significant cash flow. And then secondly, it should be convertible on the uh, option of the board, and the conversion rate should be such that, it, such that, uh, that the equity would never want to convert it unless it was clear that it actually had to be done. And finally, the, it would be protected by covenants that would prevent issuing so much equity that it would be um, maybe I'm missing something there, but that just seems like the easiest thing and, and what would effectively accomplish it. But the, the but that pretty much describes bankruptcy. Well, right? Yeah, so if you convert them, this payment, then you're in the So, so you have, then you have all the issues associated with you. Well, well, so so the management would do it before they... Well, so, but if you convert the option of the board, then you've got a private information. We need to leave the room because we have to talk, right? Uh, we have to. We have to be on time for lunch today. We be issued because the other group upstairs has to leave the room to get in and get back out again before they uh, break down. We've got another paper here.